Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your afternoon to come attend this session. Uh, I know it's a busy day and there's a lot going on, so we're really grateful to share some of this research with you. And hopefully by uh, the end of this presentation, hear a bit about your feelings, your perspectives, your reflection on what we talk about today. Before we dive into the presentation itself, I just want to briefly um, introduce myself. My name is Jure. I'm a stu uh, graduate student first year at the New School, Parsons School of Design uh, in our design. I'm, I'm Jordan Packer. We're in the same program, so design. This work came out of some, one of our classes, Urban Colloquium, looking at a series of issues that were taking place across the city. And one of the primary topics of interest for Jordan and myself was Gowanus and what was going on there. And so, yeah, our presentation is entitled Counter Analyzing New York City's First racial equity report in Gowanus. So why Gowanus? What's happening in Gowanus? From our perspective, it seems to be, for all intents and purposes, a site of forthcoming development. Gowanus is a neighborhood in Northwest Brooklyn that was recently successfully for increased mixed use development, which will largely look like taller residential buildings with some um, commercial spaces in there as well. The Gowanus Neighborhood Plan, uh, which was the proposal to rezone the Gowanus, is actually an 82 block redevelopment project, as you can see here. Um, and the process to rezone Gowanus uh, that finally culminated in 2021 actually began over a decade ago in 2006. And it has seen a number of studies published by the city, city planning, and council members. But the City Planning Commission in the spring of 2021 approved the redevelopment proposal. And then by the following fall or same fall in November, a city council approved it, making it official. This 82 block zone is quite large. It reaches uh, at its northernmost Atlantic Avenue up here, all the way down to 15th Street, Oops. making its way from 4th Avenue all the way over to Bond Street. And though, as you can see over here, it extends as far as Smith Street. And so, as I mentioned, this is a result of over a decade of study, planning, and community engagement. The area itself today is currently home primarily to industrial and manufacturing, with some residential development scattered out the area, but most predominantly these three NYCHA developments to the north of the canal. And as you can see, and we'll get into this a little bit later, they are conspicuously carved out of the initial redevelopment plan. And so what else is going on in Gowanus? There's actually quite a bit. And one of the reasons why this rezoning was so interesting, or this proposal was so interesting to us, is because of everything else that's going on. One of the sort of major aspects of the area currently uh, is that it is a US EPA designated Superfund site. The canal is the main feature of the Gowanus neighborhood. And as a Superfund site, it is the site of a fair bit of pollution. The United States intervenes in highly polluted areas that require long-term responses to cleanups through the Superfund process. Uh, and this process has been a bit of a pain in the neck uh, for the EPA, as well as the city and developers. In fact, in 2010, when the Superfund designation was initially given to the Gowanus Canal, it uh, halted outright the plans that were in motion to redevelop this area and to study it. Since the city has taken on a bit more responsibility, though not really to the EPA's sort of full liking, this process is going on. And despite it, despite the fact that this is a toxic um, site, it was identified as a opportunity for redevelopment and upzoning. Next, um, Guanas also sits in FEMA's both 1% and 0.2% annual uh, chance floodplains. As we saw with Hurricane Sandy and Ida, particularly in Gowanus, um, the area does flood. A lot of formal and informal basement units were flooded, causing mass property damage, some injuries, death. And finally, the uh, largest proportion of residents in the neighborhood actually live in these three census tracts just north of the canal, the sites of three NYCHA developments, the Gowanus Houses, Wyckoff Gardens, and Warren Street developments. As you can see with this plan, uh, with this map here, and we really tried to outline here, I mentioned it a second earlier, initially the NYCHA developments were carved out of the redevelopment plan. They were not included in the initial study, and they were, for all intents and purposes throughout much of this process, not slated to receive any direct benefits from the actual redevelopment. Ultimately, I think uh, very much in conversation with local activists, housing activists, and residents, along with council members, former council member Brad Lander and Steve Levin, where NYCHA was able to secure roughly $200 million in net desperately needed capital improvement. So that was a win in this situation. Um, 
And so finally, this brings us to the racial equity report. So what is a racial equity report? Have they been done before and why now? And, uh, early last year, or rather last summer, the Office of the Public Advocate passed a new law, intro 1572-2019B really rolls off the tongue, which requires not only that racial equity reports for land use changes are required as a part of the uniform land use review process or ULERP, uh, the process that many sites throughout the city must go through in order to be rezoned, upzoned, or downzoned. And so this is great. Okay, this new law is requiring that the uh, Department of City Planning or those responsible for these proposals conduct a study and analysis of existing historical and potential future conditions that relate to housing, economic access, and well-being, as well as the demographic makeup of these places. In addition, the city is also... Uh, requiring the development of an equitable development data tool, which I think is something that's really critical for everyone in this room in the effort to make this data more accessible, more transparent, uh, and easier to use. Primarily, I believe it seems as though that is geared more towards, again, planners and academics, but as we've seen in our study, there are a lot of opportunities for community data scientists to really get involved um, and do something similar to what we were able to do here. Let's see, oh, and right, I'm sorry. While this law was passed just at the beginning of this most recent push to rezone Gowanus. Technically, the site was not required um, to conduct a racial equity report. The law actually goes into effect just after the proposal. However, the uh, community board members, the city council members who were championing this uh, decided that this was an excellent opportunity to be the first to try this new process out and to see what it would look like in how would it, how might it impact process. And so I guess I want to just uh, really quickly, has anyone read the racial equity report? Great. Uh, excellent. Not many. And I think that uh, seems to track uh, my experience. It's it's actually difficult to find online, not super easy. But anyway, uh, so this racial equity report was published. It's the first of its kind. And we really wanted to just get a better understanding. How do the authors use data? What kind of data do they use? And what profile does that really create? <laughs> For the neighborhood of. And a couple of the sort of key concerns that were glaring for us straight from the beginning, again, was the type of data and at what scale that data was being examined at. For the report, uh, almost the entire analysis with some sort of historical background uh, is completely focused on quantitative data analysis, looking at demographics, housing, and income. And while we found that these were really helpful in providing a kind of macro context for the area, we didn't really see any of the actual voices of residents in Goa. This impacts numbers, yes, and spreadsheets, but it also impacts people's real lives. And so where are their voices? Where are their experiences directly? And then going back to the piece about scale. So as you can see uh, right here, the redevelopment area, pretty large, but when you look at a small, it only fits about a, a part of community board six. So the racial equity report, however, and as you can see in this quote, describing both data sources and the rationale with which they define the scales of their analysis, choose to primarily look at a combination of community board six and community board two when developing this demographic, economic, and housing profile for Gowanus. And one of our, again, initial questions was, is this effective, right? It does community board six and combined with community board two provide a profile of the area that actually matches the folks who are living in the same block area. And based on that data, and again, for the couple of you that have read the report, it is very clear by the end that the authors conclude in favor of the redevelopment. They see that, uh, or they have projected and calculate, calculated that the diversity of community board six will actually increase and segregation will decrease. A racial integration within a heavily white and wealthy park Slope and Carroll Gardens area will be achieved at the block level through MIH. And for those of you who don't know what MIH is, that's a mandatory inclusionary housing, which is a law in the city that requires some developments to house below market rate of rental units. Additionally, they say that it will meaningfully increase access to housing and advanced fair housing in a high opportunity high amenity zone. And already you can start to see that there is uh, a very choice profile and language that they are using to describe Gowanus, um, the areas around it, and what this redevelopment might actually mean. And so we were curious, again, does this hold true if we look at different data, if we look at it at a different scale? This is where we come in with our critique. Because this is the first racial equity report, we feel like a critical analysis is needed to ensure that the new process is fair, that it's reflective of the community that it's interpreting, 
and that it's centering the rezoning's effects on the non-white, particularly Black and Latino people of Gowanus. So this begs our research question, how does changing the boundaries of Gowanus yield a different context for the rezoning? Is the racial equity report being used as a tool to push forward the rezoning agenda? So to answer those questions, uh, we had a multifaceted approach. Because the racial equity report relies so heavily on quantitative and spatial data to describe these trends, we began our project with in-depth interviews with two Gowanus residents. And these interviews are not necessarily a representative sample by any means, it's only two. Uh, but they do bring experiences and perspectives that are lived that are different than this quantitative data. And so we'll get into those throughout with some different quotes and their experiences. And then to counteralyze the racial equity report quantitatively, we recreated many of the analyses from section 5.2.1 of the racial equity report, which really focuses on demographics and housing. And we did this using R. So the racial equity report uses data from the American Community Survey in order to observe these demographic housing and income trends. And we use the more recent and more 2020 decennial census for demographics. So before we move on, I wanted to situate the importance of the framing of the community with a quote from one of our interviews. And now the city has backed down from attempting rezonings in communities of color as being a bad idea. They're gladly admitting that was a bad idea because they're trying to justify in Gowanus that they can shift the character characterization of Gowanus as white and wealthy. And we see this sort of framing of white and wealthy popping up all over online as well. In an op-ed on city limits, they described the rezoning project as uh, the Gowanus rezoning is the first neighborhood-wide rezoning to apply mandatory inclusionary housing to create affordable units in a wider, wealthier community. It's also the first to undergo a racial impact study with data showing that the new affordable housing will lead to a more racially and economically integrated community. So that's the, the narrative that we're being fed. But we quickly learned that the boundaries of Gowanus are contested. <laughs> And one of our interviewees described this sort of shifting definition of Gowanus borders over the last decade. So based on these interviews and our desire to investigate the boundaries a little bit more, we selected three alternative boundaries for Gowanus. So on the left, you have the community board. And this is Park Slope, Red Hook, Gowanus, Carroll Gardens, and Cobble Hill, which is the largest boundary. In the middle, you have the neighborhood tabulation area or neighborhood, which is the same but excludes Park Slope. So Cobble Hill, Red Hook, Carroll Gardens, and Gowanus. And finally, we hand-selected census tracts that align with the Google Maps definition and also the informal definitions of Gowanus that we received from our interviews. So you can see the specific census tracts on that one. So to provide some additional context on our entry point into the racial equity report, Here's a quote from our second interview. The data in the racial equity report itself has also just been misleading in how it's been represented and also how it's been explained. How the data is selected and where it comes from, what boundaries are being analyzed and how those boundaries overlap with the actual area that's being rezoned. So that was a framing for our research to start answering some of those questions and really get to know what's going on in this racial equity report. So we started by looking at demographics. So to begin our understanding of Gowanus as described in these three boundaries, here is the table of the total population and aggregated demographic data from 2020. So you can see on the left, the difference in population in these three different boundaries. So it's pretty different, right? Um, about 25,000 to 169,000 between the two. Uh, the smallest and the largest. And then if we look at just the white category, we see that the community board is 59.8% white, while the selected census tracts are 51% white. So that's already raising some red flags in my mind about that difference. And then for people of color, we see that there's a full 10% difference between the community board and the selected census tracts. So pretty alarming already. So to show this data visually, a larger boundary inflates whiteness. We see a higher percentage of the white residents at the community board level and a lower percentage in the selected tracts. 
and it erases people of color. So there's a higher percentage of residents of color in the track level data than there is within the community board, nearly a 10% difference. So then we wanted to map it and really visualize this spatially. So as is noticeable from this community board map, many census tracts on this bottom, which are park slope, are over 70% white. So the darker the color, the, the more white that area is. And then this is the line showing the neighborhood. So when we narrow the boundary to just the neighborhood, the Park Slope region is no longer included and Gowanus becomes a little bit less white. And then when we narrow even more to the selected tract level, we see a much more granular view of whiteness in Gowanus as it's defined by the people that live there. So here is a population and demographic change table from 2000 to 2020. What's really striking about this is that 18%, there's an 18% decrease in the Hispanic and Latino population in these 20 years in this community, in the smallest definition of Gowanus. So I was really interested in looking at what that looked like spatially. So here we can see it. On the left, we have 2000. Um, in 2000, there were over 10 census tracts with more than 40% Hispanic and Latino people. And then on the right, you can see in 2020, only two census tracts have over 40%. So to me, this is a sign of mass displacement, and it indicates that this greater Gowanus region was primarily Hispanic and Latino in 2000, and it, it is a warning about the displacement has been occurring, and with this rezoning, it could very well continue to occur, frankly, at a much more rapid pace now. So in sum, by using larger boundaries that lump in these neighborhood neighboring communities that are especially white, Gowanus becomes more white. And when you're looking at a small boundary, Gowanus is actually only 51% white. And by claiming that 51% is a white space, you're effectively erasing the other 49% of the population. So in this way, and especially paired with what we just saw, these historical patterns of displacement, rezoning can have devastating effects on the communities of color in the area. And so with that context in mind, with understanding of the historical shifts and frankly the historical displacement of communities of color and the increase in this area, Gowanus in particular, of the sort of white population, it then also becomes uh, very interesting to look at income data, especially when disaggregated by race. And so if uh, we look here, this is the median household income for uh, the entire populations, not disaggregated by race, for the community board, the neighborhood tracks, as well as the selected tracks. And as you can see, the community board boundaries, $120,000, nothing, turn your nose out. You just, you just consider this a wealthy area. The neighborhood uh, tabulation area, similarly, only about a $4,000 difference. Um, and when you get to the selected Gowanus tracts, you actually do see a pretty uh, substantial decrease in what the, popu uh, the general population is earning when aggregated together. In turn, looking at the income data for the white population in these areas, we can see that this red dotted line maintains this blue bar across the following graphs. So that's the total, the MHI for the total population of community board sit. And we can see this actually fairly accurately reflects the white population of the area. They are indeed actually a bit wealthier um, than the average population across uh, both the neighborhood uh, tabulation area, as well as the selected census, uh, census tracts as well. So uh, representing when this report, when these op-eds, when this sort of discourse in general is describing Guana as wealthy, that appears to accurately describe at least the white population. But when looking at uh, median uh, household income data disaggregated uh, by race for the black population, we actually see that there is a great uh, difference between the median household income for the total population at each selected or each boundary at each scale. And this is most strikingly observed at the selected tract level. Looking also at the Latinx population, we see a similar <clears throat> sort of trend that this notion of wealth or that the MHI for the total population is representative of the entire community actually begins to fall apart the smaller and smaller that scale becomes or those boundaries. And so ultimately in this assessing assessments that depict Gowanus as a wealthy neighborhood actually end up homogenizing the economic diversity that actually exists there. 
um, it collapses the neighborhood into its wealthier surrounds and aligns the important perspectives and experiences of the Black and Latinx population and a population um, who is not wealthy, who is not represented at these larger scales. And ultimately, with these voices, we may get a better, more nuanced understanding of what is actually going on. What is the actual texture of people's everyday lives as it relates to living in Gowanus? So what are the key takeaways from this research that we've done? Uh, the first, the boundaries within which the data are analyzed significantly impact the demographic and economic profile that is produced. Second, the recent implementation of the racial equity report through this new legislation has good intentions, but it certainly does not guarantee equitable data. And it's incumbent upon the authors of future reports to expand their approach to include direct engagement and co-research with local residents, as well as to engage with some of these ideas about the boundary of a place before producing and uh, releasing a report. And finally, quantitative data are not objective facts and can be manipulated to support a particular narrative or to achieve a particular result, just like this Gowanus Neighborhood Plan, which passed with the support of the racial equity report. Um, and we can really see that as the, the quote that Jordan provided from the op-ed. This is also shaping the public narrative around this redevelopment, and I imagine future redevelopments to come. And so when reflecting on these key takeaways, some of the initial suggestions that we have or recommendations for future racial equity reports is that accessibility to the report needs to be increased. This not only means making it easy to find online, rather than having to dig through websites on the, at the, for the city, but also making the text itself, the data itself, easy to understand. You shouldn't need an advanced degree in statistics to be able to understand what this document is actually showing. Further, we think increased transparency about who the authors of the racial equity report are and who actually selects those authors is really critical. The public's confidence that this is a, to the extent that it's possible, um, a neutral, at least a relative objective overview um, of the information, if that is something indeed that is desired. And that ultimately, and perhaps most importantly, well-rounded data collection analysis methodologies need to be, in, need to be implemented. And they need, these need to make sure or ensure that the voices of local residents are actually centered. These populations are not simply described, but they are the ones describing the area under question. And to summarize these suggestions, we have this quote from one of our interviews, all these things like the EIS, the environmental impact study, and then the racial equity report, they're not really, or they're designed for the decision makers. They're not designed for the people. So it's still representative democracy where they assume that all they need to do is put it into language that the staffers of these electeds need to understand. And that really hits home the point that Jure was just making that we need increased accessibility and we need the community to be really centered in a racial equity report. And so looking forward, uh, this was uh, this initiative or this project rather was undertaken by the two of us in a pretty short period of time for a semester. And while we're really excited with the data we were able to uncover, there's uh, much more to be done and much more to think ahead about. As we mentioned, um, the redevelopment was approved, right? This is happening, whether we like it, whether the residents in Guanas like it or not. And so here's some sort of different ideas we're, we're bandying about in our brains about how to continue this work now that the redevelopment has actually passed. One of those being uh, continuing with this counter mapping and community data science project in Gowanus this semester, connecting with a couple of local organizations to see if there are opportunities to involve the community, the folks who actually live there in mapping out this space. And what does that do for a sense of agency and literacy when it comes to data? If these things are going to be used as a tool to uh, make sense of certain proposals and projects. Instructional recreation or recreation of our analyses uh, to be accessible to other folks with limited our experience. I think there are many opportunities to involve more, again, more and more people into actually doing this analysis themselves. I think the best way to understand this data is to see it, is to work with it yourself. Uh, and what different sort of narratives, what different ways of using data will that allow as more and more folks become involved? And as the decennial census 2020, as further data from the decennial census is related, right now it's just some basic demographic facts as well as a few housing variables. Once more of that becomes available, we'd really like to dive uh, deeper into the analysis of both housing and income data using the decennial census rather than the American Community Survey. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, we would love to hear if there are any questions or comments to get a discussion going. And then we have some questions as well that we would like to ask you and have you engaging with these topics with us.
please. Uh, yeah, I've got a question. Do you know if the, I'm sorry, I don't remember the long name of the, the number associated with the law for the racial equity report. Do you know if there were any required or recommended standards for what's included in there, or was it just you need to produce some kind of like non specific racial equity report to have clarity on what that would look like? To my recollection, it, it's pretty vague. Um, I know that it does require like a profile of the demographic and, e and economic trends in the region, but most of the language around it is staying. And the, the equitable data tool, I haven't heard more about what that really Yeah, and just reading, I'm reading from the law or, or a note about the law. The substance of racial equity reports would vary by application type, but all would include a statement of how the proposed project relates to the goals and strategies to affirmatively further fair housing, remote, equitable access to opportunity. That can be pretty expansively interpreted. And we can see actually in this first example, I think that's exactly what the authors intended to do and perhaps think that they have. And while in some ways I think they were successful in others, again, I think it allied certain aspects of the reality on the ground. Yeah. And just to add to that, the racial equity report authors are handpicked by proponents of the rezoning. So that relationship as well, they're choosing who's writing the report that falls broadly into this category. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Is a EPA box on, I know it's toxic, the site, is it all, right? Mm -hmm. The water pollution stuff in the mm -hmm. Yeah. So my, my question to you is, um, why would they want to develop an area that was once a super long site? I'm just here, unfortunately, your guess good as we, we can we can speculate right this is the allowable density in Gowanus previous district zoning was extremely low you see a lot of uh one story maybe four story max apartment buildings a lot of auto repair shops a lot of uh, these big storage self-storage areas and so there isn't a huge amount going on and so i think the city views it's close to the water it's sandwiched between these wealthy and white neighborhoods park slow carroll gardens cobble hill so why not continue to build it up and that very much is our question. Not, yeah. not only is it's a toxic site, but if anyone knows a lick about uh, combined sewage outflow in the area uh, or in throughout the city, this is one of the main uh, sort of sites that a lot of that is, is dumped into. And the EPA has raised these concerns as well. There are a couple of sites in particular that are cited for, say, a school or a, a development that's 100 percent affordable housing on some of the more toxic sites mm -hmm. there. And if, again, if you read the background and the conversations between the EPA and the city, they are at odds. They do not agree on the right way to go. I think this also provides the city the opportunity to maybe offload some of the responsibility for the cleanup onto developers. But again, as we've seen, sort of developers are, are they want it uh, cleaned up quick and able to build as soon as they can. Ultimately, they're looking to extract rents uh, and to increase their profit margins. So they're um, so a wee bit dubious, I would say. Right. 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 <laughs> I get very um, cautious when I hear the word rezoning. I usually relate rezoning to gentrification because you can't do one without zoning. That's the bottom line to me. I'm not, not a politician. I'm a late person, but that's that's the signal I get when I hear the word rezoning. I think I, I, I think you're exactly right. In fact, I would say very much the current conditions in Gowanus, particularly when we're looking at, as Jordan showed, that mass displacement of particularly the Hispanic population. Um, that's at least in part due to the actual, the, re the contextual rezoning all along the boundary of Gowanus, right? South Park Slope, North Park Slope, Carroll Gardens, Foreign Hill, they've each been upzoned, or rather not upzoned, but contextually rezoned. And what that served to do in the case of these wealthy neighborhoods is keep the density quite low there, which in fact actually drives up um, the price of land, it makes it you know more attractive to developers. And so we also have serious looking at this data and seeing the history of Gowanus, that this will also lead to gentrification and displacement. The folks who are living in NYCHA, they are in protected housing to a certain extent. We don't have to worry too much about that displacement, but they buy their groceries. They, if they're on a fixed income, uh, there are amenities currently in Gowanus that suit their, and that meet their needs. Often in these cases, it's not just displacing people. 
people from their homes. It's drying up all the places that they were able to buy groceries and other basic. So thank you so much for your question. That fridge used to be closed off. Mm -hmm. These got the fridge blocked with signs saying the little skeleton on it. That's why, even though I was young, I remember the danger of that fridge. And fast forward, it's very discouraging to hear this, that they are going to do this. Mm -hmm. Governments are sitting by watching, knowing they know this, and then letting it slide by. It's very it's sad. There's a lot of artists who hear this, and some people, and there's a group of artists who want us, and they've created a uh, so the developers do work, are still using the new building. Um, but I was also wondering if you, if you guys have talked to any people who worked on the study in person with them. Not able to do that, uh, at least not last semester. But we do know one of the authors, Dr. Lance Freeman, he's a professor at uh, Columbia. So he's local to the city. And I think at in this next stage of our project, we would like to connect and, and really get a better understanding. Yeah. Since the first one, it'll be interesting. There's like a pattern of how they come out of other space. We have time for one more question. So going back to the concept of this basement, I, I really appreciate the the side by side maps that you showed. It's like really striking evidence that this basement has been occurring in this neighborhood. But so when we think about this rezoning, the outcome is going to be there's going to be more housing and like more density of housing in this neighborhood, and there is a volume research that suggests that provide more housing for best displacement. So I'm wondering what led you to the conclusion or assumption that the rezoning would actually continue the patterns of displacement. I think that's a great question. So the first thing is most of the housing that's going to be built, no one in the community, will, when it's luxury housing, that only draws in people that can afford that housing. And the amount of affordable housing is very low. I don't know if you know the percent. I believe it's about, yeah, yeah. yeah. out of about 8,500 units, only 3,000, maybe 35% of the units. And again, sorry to <laughs> uh, step in, but um, that ranges from what I think about 60% affordable to 125%. So affordable housing necessarily need affordable to the folks who most need um, housing. And the final point is the affordable housing has been slated to be developed on the most toxic part of this region, public place, which to me is like inhumane. So I wouldn't really consider that a positive investment in affordable housing. Sorry, this is so much, but I just want to go back to this one slide. As this is the site for public place, it's hard to see without all the streets. But as you can see here, this little red text says Citizens Former Manufactured Gas Plant Site. And as you can see, there are two others, and these appear to be the most toxic sites along the canal. So again, to Jordan's point, we're a bit concerned. And in, in, in a letter from the US EPA um, to the city, they also stated these concerns, particularly about the public place. Do we want to, it seems like folks still have questions. Do you want one more? Um, sure, I think you've had your hand up for a yeah, while. Yeah, I just a couple of points that, um, just to each point, I would suggest looking at what the relationship, that political relationship was at the mm -hmm. time, and how that influenced. I believe that was mostly Trump's EPA. With a very democratic city like New York, there's a lot of political implications to to asking around the from the EPA to the city. And a secondary point, you show the percent change in Hispanic population, people of color from 20 to 22, or 20 to yes, 20, 20 2000 to 2020. I'm curious if you've looked at absolute numbers in terms of displacement to understand how that may be to the comment of the person before, how that may actually, the rezoning may be a net positive because it is introducing in absolute numbers, people of color into a community. I would, if it were me, I would analyze what the general demographic breakdown is of affordable housing in those percent AMIs across the city to understand what the racial makeup of people living in affordable units would be to under, to be able to say 2000 to 2020, we absolutely saw displacement that was happening regardless of the rezoning. Based off of that, what is the, the more dynamic trend over time absolutely. in absolute numbers? And so that was not analysis that we did, but within the racial equity report itself, it, it does actually conduct that analysis. And again, as we showed, they ultimately conclude that Yes, by, by nature of those who are seeking a mandate accommodation and mandatory inclusionary housing, historically in the area and then moving out, it will ultimately draw in people who need it and, and will increase the, the racial diversity less. Did you have anything that you wanted to add to that point? 
no, I think those are really good suggestions for further uh, further research on this. Yeah. And I just want to end on this slide that has um, our contact information. And if any of you want to reach out or potentially collaborate or talk to us after this session, we would love to hear from you. Sure. Yeah. Just throw like a 30 second opinion out there. I think a lot, I think, thank you very much for the quality of context on this. Cause I think when we talk about like the displacement of a neighborhood and the proportion of accounts of families of different backgrounds in an area, like just because some proportion or count of units are affordable and then that brings in some folks, that doesn't discount the fact that there are real families kicked out and like an actual community that gets kicked out it's not just like a count of people with a certain background it's you're sending people out and folks that actually come back maybe rotted by a lottery and not part of the same community thank you all so much for, for